And we have another member of the CFR, Professor Mortimer Alder, said that we must do everything we can to, to abolish the United States. As long as states insist that they are supreme arbiters of their destinies, that as sovereign entities, their decisions are subject to no higher authority, international organizations will never be able to guarantee the maintenance of peace. So this thing, as long as we have this idea of national independence, we're just going to keep having wars. In the annual report from 1987, 1988, we see the Council on Formulations, Garrett Gong. And um, he, he wrote some books. Now, let's go ahead and get started. Again, we are in class number four, as you can see, of our uh, Tree of Liberty Society Extremist Boot Camp. Uh, just some things just to kind of reiterate what some of the things that we've uh, gone into, because there are a lot of other organizations that do talk about the fact uh, that we do face a conspiracy. Uh, but for what we've something that's unique to us, something that, that I've been able to uncover is the fact that the international conspiracy is influencing our local communities. And we're using Utah as the case study. But I've also done presentations in Idaho and Wyoming and, and done research for other states all across the country. And what I'm about to show you tonight for Utah is, is how they operate in your area. So this is something that can help you identify conspirators in your community and how they infiltrated your community, even if it's a conservative state or a state that is thought of as being conservative, like Idaho or, or, or Utah, and, and how that happens. Because we don't have UN troops marching down the street. We are being delivered over to them by our national and local officials. And so this is something we've been able to identify of how, these inter how this international conspiracy uses a funnel to be able to get into our communities. And, and all of a sudden, you know, we've got Agenda 2030 going on. Uh, we have population control. We have attacks on property rights. We have attacks on the unborn and, and so on and so on. How is that happening? And then it's not happening on accident. So some key principles that we look at principle number one that we've gone over is our freedoms aren't being lost by accident we're not like oh my goodness right we talked about this crazy game of whack-a-mole where if these things were happening on accident they were just randomly spontaneously popping up um that would be something that would be impossible to to be able to fight because all these things are really important but we understand that we're fighting a, a arsonist starting these fires it's key that we understand that uh, principle number two is that we aren't dealing with the lesser of two evils we are not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. We face a conspiracy. So when we point out that so-and-so, some elected official, is doing something, it's not saying, oh, my goodness, you just want everybody to be perfect. No. That, that mindset of letting the good be the enemy of the, uh, of the perfect, or the perfect the enemy of the good, sorry, um, is, is how the conspiracy gets us to keep it going and not to oppose it and not to stop it where it stands. Because we think, oh, we're just we're just being perfectionists. We're not to, we're just being scorched earth. No, we face a conspiracy, and in, unless we understand that, we're going to continue to let bad guys stay in power and support them because they're at least they're not as bad as the other guy. That's their design. This is designed that way to make us think that, so that we continue to perpetuate the conspiracy. Number three, you have to understand the enemy you face, or you will not be effective in your efforts to defend liberty and the kingdom of God. We have to understand this. We have, if we don't understand the enemy that we face, we're going to continue to perpetuate the system that we've had for the last, you know, 200 years almost, uh, where the conspiracy continues to gain power because we follow the solutions that have been made popular for the last 50 to 75 years that we think is designed to get us to move forward towards liberty, but are actually designed to perpetuate the conspiracy and their power and actually magnify their power. If, you know, just think about it uh, this way. If, you know, you are going on a date with Ted Bundy, your young lady going on a date with Ted Bundy, and uh, you're, you don't know that he's Ted Bundy, that's not going to end very well, right? We're not trying to be pessimistic. We're trying to say this is the score. If you're going on a date with Ted Bundy, you're going to want to know about it because you're going to be able to protect yourself. The same thing with uh, with with the culture, with economics, and with politics. If we don't understand that we face a conspiracy, a group of Ted Bundys, so to say, we're going to be in the same situation as the young lady that is going on a date with a mass murderer. We have to understand that. So we face the worldwide conspiracy. So 
Again, why do we talk about conspiracy at all? It's very, very important that we understand this principle. Brigham Young said that we should not only un, um, study good and its effects upon our race, but also evil and its consequences. We have to understand both for the reasons that I just discussed. And also in the Doctrine and Covenants, we learn that therefore we should waste and wear our lives bringing to light all the hidden things of darkness wherein we know them. These should then be attended to with great earnestness. We need to be earnest in our efforts to expose this conspiracy. We need to wear out our lives to expose this conspiracy. If we don't understand that, then we're, if we don't wear out our lives, if we don't work hard to do that, then we're going to be in a tough situation. This thing's going to continue to get big, bigger and bigger. Uh, Moroni also talked about this. He says, I'm telling you about the conspiracy that evil may be done away with and that Satan may have no power upon the hearts of the children of men. Knowing about the conspiracy doesn't feed it, doesn't give it more power. It helps to stop it just for the reasons that I mentioned a second ago. The more we understand it, the less influence it will have on us, the less power it will have over us, and the better equipped we will be to stand up for truth and right and not to succumb to the natural um, compromises that are used to get us to embrace evil. Right. And I mentioned this earlier the faces, the issues we face are like fires. There's too many to fight. We are fighting an arsonist doing this. We have to understand that. Now let's talk about the conspiracy and it's coming to Utah. We need to identify and guard against those working to destroy our faith and our culture. And again, wherever you are. So just kind of a little bit of history backing up to kind of where we are at today, some history. The United States in the 1840s at, at the very latest had apostatized fully from the United States Constitution. So you have the government and you have the Constitution. And we need to start separating those two, enti those two entities uh, from each other. They're not one of the same. When we're defending the Constitution, we're not defending the institution of the United States government. They are supposed to follow it, but, they've, uh, but the government apostatized from the Constitution. And so the saints had to, to avoid that and to be able to live according to the dictates of their own conscience, to be able to uh, defend the principles of the Constitution, they had to leave the United States. And they formed a new nation, an independent nation called Deseret. Now, this independent nation did not last uh, very, very long at all. It, uh, the United States, you know, seeing that, hey, we don't, just like Satan doesn't want anybody to leave his grasp, and so they, they try to hold on tight to us. And so just a couple of years after we established this new nation, the United States entered an illegal treaty, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, with the Mexican government and claimed this property that wasn't either one of theirs to claim. But to protect our interest, the, uh, the church introduced and formed its own political party called the People's Party. That's an example of the uh, political ticket that it had uh, with its candidates uh, that it was supporting that would support the Constitution and the liberty of the people. But as we were continuing to stand for liberty and the Constitution, Satan did not like this. And so he sent out his army, Johnson's army. And uh, he was, Brigham Young was deposed as the legitimately elected governor of the nation of Deseret and the new territory of Deseret as it was uh, invaded by the United States government. And this was done by the president at the time was uh, Buchanan, James Buchanan. He was a member of the Bohemian Club and attended the Bohemian Grove uh, the organization that I mentioned uh, uh, two weeks ago in our class, or last time. And so uh, we had 12 governors that were imposed on us by the federal government, imposed upon the people of Utah, um, until we were basically uh, forced into becoming a state. They persecuted and prosecuted us and said, well, if you just do what we say and you become a state, then we'll start to leave you alone and you can make your own laws. Well, that was just, uh, you know, the uh, rare rabbit saying, don't throw me in that briar patch. And so uh, we, we, we fell for it and we became a state and we've been continually being brought into this federal unconstitutional system ever since. And so what was leading up to this, John Taylor warned about it. He said that this scenes we are now witnessing are the in this territory are the results of a deep laid and carefully planned conspiracy. He was not afraid to, to call it conspiracy. He dared to call it a conspiracy and use that word and understand where we're at. And he said, 
that this conspiracy was made up of the rich and the poor, the religious and the irreligious, the moral and the immoral, and they all came together. Its originators have effected a wonderful secret combination with the purpose to combine to destroy Mormonism. The conspiracy had a goal in mind, of course, to enslave mankind. So how do you change any culture? You have two opposing forces. We see this right now in the Middle East as we've, you know, in the past 20 years, we have been trying to spread freedom and democracy, supposedly. And uh, our values, well, United States values, I should say, are very different than those in the Middle East. And so how do you get that? That's the same kind of situation that we had here in Utah at this point in time. And so how do you get these things where we have two opposing forces to come together and to be at peace with one another? Karl Marx in the Communist Manifesto laid out this process. He says, in the beginning, this cannot be affected except by means of despotic inroads, by means of measures, meaning little by little, therefore, which appear economically insufficient and untenable, but which in the course of the movement outstrip themselves and necessitate further inroads upon the old social order. So in other words, this is done by one small step at a time. Economically insufficient, untenable. These changes seem so small that you're the unreasonable person. You're the jerk if you don't go along with it. You're just not able to compromise and to work with other people if you don't go along with these changes. But these changes, each and every single one of them, are designed to necessitate because they're untenable. They can't last by themselves. They, they make it so they need the next change, which then necessitates the next change. And little by little, the culture and the society becomes something completely different that it would have never done if those changes were overnight. That boiling the frog approach that we, you know, see the conspiracy operate so much today. So what is the social order that they wanted to change, they wanted to destroy? What was it that we were trying to build here in Utah that would make us a free people, an independent people that we wouldn't apostatize from the principles of the Constitution? The things that we were trying to build, to build Deseret, to build political Zion, to remain independent was, of course, first, don't merge with Babylon. We need our economic independence. Otherwise, we're dependent upon them, and we will uh, change ourselves to be able to maintain that economic um, stability. The second is not to submit to cons unconstitutional government. It was essential that we were politically independent because of the, uh, if we had merged with an unconstitutional system, we're going to become unconstitutional as well. So to be able to maintain the rights and liberty of everyone, we had to separate, politically speaking. So three, don't let the enemy educate your children. Of course, we have to have a, a culture of, ec of education independence. You, in, you don't want someone that's a, you know, a cannibal uh, teaching you a, a cooking class. And, and so that's with education, it's essential that we maintain an education independence and not uh, because of the future generations. And we're going to look into that in, in, as we go through each one of these and what that means and what it was that we were trying to do. And then how it was that, of course, because we, we are not economically independent, we are not politically independent. And most people in Utah go, send their children to government schools. Thankfully, that's that's a trend that's starting to, to reverse um, and it needs to reverse even more. Uh, but of course, we are still, as in as a bulk of society, sending our children to Rome, to Babylon, to be educated. So don't merge with Babylon. Brigham Young explained this key principle saying they want the Mormons to build cities for them to possess. We move from Missouri, we go to Illinois, and we're building up these cities, and then we get driven out. This we shall do no more for them, he says. If we build cities, we mean to possess them. He says, the Lord says that we shall never do another day's work, nor spend another dollar to build up a Gentile city or nation. That way we're building up the kingdom of God. We're building up Zion as opposed to building up the world, building up Babylon. And so it, it says, in, and we talked about this in uh, two classes ago, the importance of when we are dependent upon them for something, then we give up our conscience to go along with it. There were people that got shots to be able to keep their jobs. There were people that wore masks to be able to go shopping. And so because they felt that they needed to do those things, 
They were not independent financially, meaning they were integrated into the system. And so they felt that they, they had to, to be able to keep their jobs. They had, to, they had to put a poison in their body or to be able to go shopping, get the food their family needed. They felt they had to cover up their face. And so you can see how important it is that we remain economically independent. So now one of the ways that they got us to get away from this, we have um, Alfred Cumming, who was the first territorial governor imposed on us by the federal government. And he uh, wrote to the Utah legislature and told them that the laws of Deseret were made in isolation without our oversight. You guys were all by yourself. You guys didn't get our permission. You guys didn't get our input. You cannot expect a continuance of that isolation, which has characterized your early history and new relations between us must occur. I urge you to appoint committees to prepare new laws suited for your re-entrance into the national system. We have to start working you and getting you in to that economic order. So the next one is don't submit to unconstitutional government. We must understand that key principle, even today, where we have to start to nullify and disobey laws that are unconstitutional. John Taylor, you know, even though today we have this culture of obeying the government no matter what, we have a, we had very much civil disobedience in, in our mindset during this time where he says, I defy the United States because we are today a kingdom of priests and it is essential that we submit to the laws of that priesthood and be governed by them in all of our actions. We have to be able to support the principles of liberty. John W. Taylor, the son of John Taylor, explained that the legislature took no action without approval of the church president. And so even though we were invaded by an outside force and they were putting their own leaders over us, we were still operating in a way where we're like, okay, we got to do this the best we can to be, and we got to work towards being independent. And so they just pretended that Alfred Cumming wasn't really there. They nullified and they didn't, and they didn't do anything without approval of who should have been the real governor, who was the elected governor. John Taylor explained this principle more. He says, what do we mean by the kingdom of God? He says, there is the church of God and the kingdom of God. And the church refers to more spiritual things and the kingdom to temporal rule and government. So the church and the kingdom of God are two separate organizations with two separate and distinct jobs. And so because, you know, we were resisting the government, we were saying we're not going to go along with unconstitutional laws. We wanted to protect liberty. They started to pass lots of unconstitutional laws against the people of Utah, attacking their religion, attacking their, attacking uh, the schools and the children. And uh, this guy right here, who was uh, Frank, I'm sorry, he was the Secretary of State, James Blaine, who was also a member of the Bohemian Club and attended the Bohemian Grove. And speaking to uh, Frank Cannon, who was the son of George Hugh Cannon, um, he was kind of the liaison between church leaders and people in Washington, D.C., Frank Cannon being uh, that guy. I uh, was talking about the Colin Strumble Bill, which was passed in 1899, 1889, sorry. And prior to that, there probably a lot of you have heard of uh, legislation called the Edmunds Tucker Act, which was going after the church. It disenfranchised the church as a legal organization. The church didn't exist as a legal institute, an institution for uh, many years. And uh, the, the government um, confiscated its property under this legislation, and its leaders were on the run and put in, in prison because of this type of legislation. And so, but most of these things uh, uh, just really attack specifically the members of the church that were um, uh, living the principle of plural marriage. And so this Colm Strumble bill that we see here in 1889 went a step further. It said, we don't care what you do. It's what you believe. If you believe, if you're a member of a church that teaches this, then you, no matter what your actions are, we're going to punish your beliefs. We're going to say that you can't own property. You're not a citizen of the United States. Uh, you can't serve on a jury, and therefore everybody on the jury is going to be somebody that wants to put you in prison. And so going after every member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so George Cannon, uh, uh, through his son Frank, was negotiating with people in Congress to get them to, to kill the bill. And so they were able to um, negotiate some things in, in April. This is April of 1890. And they say, we're going to basically, we're going to, coming up real soon, we're going to be giving up plural marriage. And so if we do that, you guys are going to kill the bill, right? So they, they agree to kill the bill. And James Blaine says to Frank Cannon, wouldn't it be possible for your people 
to find some way to bring yourselves into harmony with the law and institutions of this country. You are too weak to set yourselves up superior to this nation. You know, forget about the scriptures and the miracles that were provided because you guys are just too small. We'll help you this time, but nothing permanent can uh, be done until you get into line, until you start to obey us and do whatever we say, whenever we say it, we're going to keep going after you, is what this government liaison said. And so this guy, Robert Newton Baskin, one of the least known people in Utah history, was actually the most influential, especially during this time frame. Um, he was a non-Mormon, but he was the mayor of Salt Lake City and had other positions as a, as a, as a, just, as a judge. And um, he was the author of the Colum Strumble Bill. And he explains the reason why he wrote the bill. He says the purpose of the bill was to take away from the priesthood the political power, which it had so long wrongfully usurped and shamefully abused. This legislation was using plural marriage as a boogeyman, but their real goal was to get rid of the kingdom of God. And so Eli Murray was one of the, another governor that was imposed on us by the federal government, would write to D.C. And, and talk to them about what was going on in Utah. And he really laid out exactly what the score was, exactly what was going on. He says, what do I care as to their beliefs? Their right to, to belief I would defend. But obedience to our law is required, and the exercise of temporal power by ecclesiastical authority will no longer be tolerated. You know, forget the First Amendment to the Constitution that guarantees the, the free exercise of religion. No, no, no. You've got to keep your beliefs all right, right up here. You do not start to practice your beliefs. You know, we've got to tell Daniel to get back in his room and stop praying. Otherwise, we're going to send him to the lion's den. Forget this idea of, of building the kingdom of God. He says in another, uh, in another time, he says, If the Mormons continue to promote liberty in the kingdom of God, the sword will be invoked to subdue them. They always accuse liberty people of being violent, but it's them that always use violence to squelch those that go against them. They are the ones that are using violence, and they are going to use the sword. They're going to use violence against us if we continue to promote these eternal principles. Another occasion, he said, either the church will have to surrender or the government will. The exercise of political power by ecclesiastical authority should be abolished in Utah. That's really where it's at. Either the church will have to surrender or the government will. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. One of them is going to have to give up something. The next thing we want to talk about is the culture of educating our children. We learn in the Doctrine and Covenants that education, of course, is very important to the Lord. And in section 55, the Lord commanded W.W. Phelps to assist Oliver Cowdery to do the work of printing, selecting, and writing books for schools in this church that little children also may receive instruction before me as is pleasing unto me. So got to write books and that are done in a way that is done within the bounds the Lord has set. So there's another principle here that uh, we, we need to understand that Brigham Young laid out that helps us to really see what's going on. He says, I'm opposed to free education as much as I'm opposed to taking away property from one man and giving it to another. Would I encourage free schools by taxation? No. What the government, the Supreme Court has ruled with the government funds, the government controls. We have to be free of government funding, especially with the, with the training up of our children. Otherwise, eventually, as we get used to and we get dependent upon those strings, we're not independent of the world. We're dependent upon them for that money, and we will do what they say to be able to maintain that. It is immoral to use these free schools by taxation. So now this, uh, uh, the governor, Eli, uh, not Eli Murray, but we have um, Alfred Cumming talking about the schools and buttering us up, talking to the legislature saying, man, you guys have some awesome schools here, but you don't have any free government schools yet, right? You got no free or common schools. So some system should therefore be adopted to enable every child to obtain these inestimable benefits. Got to get these free government schools, even though what your religious leaders are telling you is that this is evil and it's going to lead to control of your children. You guys have got to set this up. But not only did they do it in government, but there are all parts of, you know, the conspiracy was 
was using different entities to be able to get us to reject this principle of education independence. And we have some key admissions from those involved in that. Um, in the Presbyterian Church, they in 1881, they had a conference or an assembly where they were reporting of how their funds were being used in Utah. And they were setting up free schools in Utah to be able to, so that, um, and it says here, quote, our schools unsettle the faith of the children of Mormonism, and these schools develop into churches as a rule. They, the schools, are the entering wedge to split parental opposition through the children. And this is this has not changed, even though we don't have, you know, a lot of people sending their kids to, to schools of other religions. In the traditional sense, we're sending our kids to the religion of the state. And these schools today, even of the state, are have turned into churches. They developed into churches as a rule. The doctrine of the state is what is being taught in these government schools also should be known as government churches. S government schools are government churches teaching the doctrine. So even if, you know, you're not sending your child to a, a different religions school in this sense, and even if they don't leave the religion of their fathers, which we're seeing happen in just massive scales today, because they're being sent to the religion of the state every single day. They are changing the culture. And so that the church itself, the beliefs of the members, the beliefs, the culture of the members is adopting the culture and the religion of the state. A, uh, an Anglican bishop uh, had a similar admission here. He says, in Utah, our schools were the backbone of our missionary work. Adults were fanatics, but the plastic minds of the young we could hope to win. They understood that you could still, you know, the children's minds are malleable. And if you can get them for six hours, eight hours a day, then you can mold them in the direction you want them to and have your parents, the parents don't even realize it. No matter how much, you know, you try, you're like, okay, you've got all day at school and then they come home and you've got maybe an hour or two while they're doing homework reiterating what they learned at government church. And you think maybe you're going to make, make a few corrections and say, oh, that's not true. And they're going to like believe it or they're going, it's not going to have an impact on them. Society today and the culture shows that that does not work because A, you got two things. It's being brought into their minds over and over again. And then B, why they're they're in their mind. They're like, well, if this is wrong and this is evil and this is not what my values are, then why are you sending me to this institution day after day to be taught things that are against our values? So there must, it must not be that bad. And so it gets the next generation to adopt the religion of the state. And so we can see we don't have economic independence. We don't have political independence. And we don't have educational independence. We've adopted these things and our, you know, not only is our national government um, apostatized from the Constitution, but all our state governments, our county governments, and our city governments are violating the principles of natural law and the Constitution every single day. So this conspiracy, this deep laid and carefully planned conspiracy, focus, you know, it, it is continuing to this day. And it's important that we don't just stick to, okay, well, at least my kids aren't going to this, you know, church school. We have to understand the principles, not the personalities, because the names change, the organizations change. We have to understand the principles so that no matter when and where we are, we're going to hold to the same standard and we'll be able to apply it no matter when and, and who is uh, a part of it. And so the local conspiracy, we're going to use this uh, again, I'm talking about this the Utah case study. These principles apply no matter when and where you are. So in, in Utah, we have the Alta Club in Salt Lake City, which was formed in 1883. And they said it was for the purpose of helping Gentiles to build business relationships in a Mormon-dominated climate. This is according to their own autobiography. Their own admissions are really good to be able to understand what they're really doing. So they say this. This is their outward thing is they're trying to get people to be able to have these networks and these relationships that uh, they couldn't have because of our culture of trying to build economic independence. Their claim is that it was just a social club, which always stuck firmly to its original purpose of being social, and that never took sides on any issue. It neither advocated nor opposed public causes. 
reminded me of the Council on Foreign Relations when I read this. They claim the same exact thing. So I wanted to dig a little bit deeper. And I came across Heber J. Grant's journal. And in that, he was, this is during the time where the state of Utah, excuse me, the state of Utah was in its constitutional convention to write its state constitution to be able to enter into uh, the union. And uh, so Heber J. Grant's journal, recording conversation that he had with um, John Henry Smith, who was the church's representative at the convention. And Henry Smith, uh, John Henry Smith, said Heber J. Grant, the Alta Club, having agreed to work against women's right to vote, and that they proposed to use their influence to defeat the Constitution if equal suffrage were made a part of it. So we see previously in their own biography, they say, oh, no, we, we don't oppose or advocate public causes. But just going back to the 1890s, we see from the just from the get go, they are using their influence to change public policy. And then going further, Council on Foreign Relations, where one minute they'll deny something, the next minute they're going to advocate for what they just denied. They were advocating. They said that they played an important role in diminishing the bitterness of the conflict between the church and the world to a point which permitted the territory to become a state and to function politically under the national system. So following Karl Marx's program in the Communist Manifesto of doing things one small step at a time to this very day, as I mentioned in Invasion Volume 2, and I document in Invasion Volume 2, that to this very day, this is the funnel where they are being used and where the meetings happen, where the plans take place. Wherever we're different from the world, this is where it takes place, where they develop a new program to get us to merge with the world. And so we learn from the scriptures that the conspirators protect each other in their crimes to make sure that they are not um, punished for their crimes. In Helaman chapter 6, we read that they did unite with those bands of robbers and did enter into their covenants and their oaths that they would protect and preserve one another in whatsoever circumstances they should be placed, that they should not suffer for their murders and their plunderings and their stealings. They protect each other so they will not be, they will not suffer for their murders even, and their plunderings and their stealings. And we saw that very same thing happen. I did an investigation. I went to the Alta Club in downtown Salt Lake City, and I, I asked for a, uh, their, basically their intern, for a, a tour of the building. And we're walking through the building, and um, in one room there was a painting of, of a, a man on his knees begging the forgiveness of a young lady. And, um, you know, just kind of made a, a comment to her, oh, man, that guy must have gotten in trouble. And she's like, oh, he probably, you know, got caught with a prostitute. And then points to a door, the back door, and she just nonchalantly says, oh, and that's where we sneak in the prostitutes today. And so to this day, they are engaged in illegal behavior, and they are protected in their crimes. As we learn, during the time when uh, Cleon Skousen was the chief of police, and Jay Bracken Lee was the mayor. So Cleon Skousen, as the chief of police, he had what was called a vice squad, where he was going after and investigating organizations that were involved in illegal activity. And so as the mayor, which is the boss of the chief of police, went to uh, Cleon Skousen and said, you are not allowed to go after the Alta Club, naming them by name. And on their website, at least in the past, uh, they, they, they change it from time to time, they kind of brag about their involvement in uh, the criminal world and in these illegal activities. And so he said, you're not allowed to go after the Alpha Club, protecting them in their crimes. But Cleon Skousen didn't follow that. And he actually um, raided another one of the places that he was told not to raid. And who, lo and behold, who was there? The mayor. And shortly after this bust, uh, Jay Brackenlee fires Cleon Skousen as the chief of police because he didn't go along in protecting them and their crimes. So they are involved in organized crime and they talk about this in their own autobiography. Uh, they talk about their involvement in rigging elections. So if we think this is a new thing, eh, it's not a new thing. Uh, they talk about uh, the group's uh, contact with the so-called underworld, which is the nickname for the criminal world, the mafia, 
was a man with the nickname of Ed. And reading in the biography, he discusses what is the relationship with the Alpha Club and the criminal world. Ed, Ed dies. And uh, his replacements in the underworld come to the leaders of the Alta Club and says, if you, and tells the leadership of the Alta Club, if you want to continue our relationship with help you, helping you to be able to make sure elections go your way, we are asking three things of you. We want, uh, first, we want a non denominational religious leader to speak at his funeral. We want the mayor to be there. We want the governor of the state of Utah to be there. And the, the leaders of the Alta Club say, not a problem. We'll provide that for you 100%. Took care of that, was able to maintain their relationship with the underworld. Uh, one of the uh, chiefs, of, one, of, one of the mayors of Salt Lake City during the 80s was this guy. His name was uh, Ted Wilson, or is Ted Wilson, where he was the mayor. He is now the executive director of the Agenda 21, Agenda 2030 uh, organization called UCARE and also the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance, which is also working to implement the Agenda 2030 agenda. And in a magazine called Town and Country Magazine uh, in 1983, so 100 years after the formation of the Alta Club, the Town and Country Magazine uh, focuses an issue on Salt Lake City. Who do you want to get to know to be on the inside track in Salt Lake City? And they interview the mayor. And just like a Carol Quigley type of admission from Tragedy and Hope, Ted Wilson admits, does, a, um, uh, just, does this just top-notch admission. He says, Utah has a power structure that's quite concentrated, and it tends to operate behind closed doors at the Alta Club. So Utah's insiders meet in secret at where? At the Alta Club to produce their, their plans. And so as a part of the uh, the uh, the club, the uh, they formed another organization called the Salt Lake Chamber of Commerce as part of their plan to merge us with the world. How do we do that? This, this is the economic part of that. In their book, in their autobiography, they say another gesture in pursuit of pacification, which was supported by several Alta Club founders, was the organization of the Salt Lake Chamber of Commerce. Now, wherever you're at, the major chamber of commerce in your city. Now, I'm not going to, you know, say that this applies maybe to all of the, you know, the little city ones, uh, but definitely the ma the major uh, chamber of commerce in your state serves this same purpose as well. There could be no question as to the purpose of this project, and anyone who participated in it was certainly on the side of liquidation of the conflict. Three Alta Club founders ac accepted places on the organizing committee. So using this organization kind of as the outward face to be able to introduce legislation and be able to promote certain programs that would be able to start to move the culture in the direction that they wanted them to move. Pacification. How do you pacify? How does Satan get you to you know, pacify yourself? Gets you to go along. Maybe even compromises. He's like, I'm going to give something up. Now you give something up. He wins when you do that. And that's the exact... The Chamber of Commerce in Salt Lake City, yeah, that is their program. That is the, the, the open face of that. We saw that during uh, 2020 and 2021, where they were the ones, they were the force, because you know there was so much opposition against government enforced mandates. The Chamber of Commerce got involved and said, our businesses are going to enforce mandates. Our businesses are going to enforce vaccine mandates. We are the ones that stay safe, to stay open to get to, the, to scaring people into obedience and compliance. That was their program. And so we had the conspiracy infiltrating and focusing on the people in power locally, right? In Massachusetts, they're gonna focus on maybe Democrats and Catholics, because that's the, the bulk of the population. Or in Utah, they're focusing on Mormons and Republicans. Republicans and Mormons. And so to do that, right, because we had the culture of financial and economic independence, members of the church were not joining and not going along with the Chamber of Commerce. And so they, they set up a new plan. They had ZCMI, which was started as a way for members of the church to be able to get the things that they couldn't produce themselves without having to go to Babylon to get it. And so, but then, right, that's when it started. But then when it, but early 2000s, when it finally kind of goes out of business or goes out of business, um, it just was indistinguishable from Dillard's or Macy's. And so this is kind of in that uh, transition 
time frame where the leaders of ZCMI were more interested in in political influence and economic success, uh, more like your Harry Reeds or your Mitt Romneys, if that paints a good picture for you. And so the Chamber of Commerce, the Alta Club folks, go to the leaders of ZCMI and they get them to join the Chamber of Commerce. And so your average members are saying, well, that guy's a good active member and he's a part of that, it must be okay. Starting to shift the culture. And so members start to join the Chamber of Commerce and then start to join the Alta Club itself. And so that Town & Country magazine not only talked about that, that power structure that Ted Wilson talked about, kind of goes into more detail about that and it explains who's involved in the power structure. This power structure that meets in secret at the Alta Club, consisted of the head of the Chamber of Commerce, the publisher of the Salt Lake Tribune, and the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so again, we have here uh, David O. McKay and John Gallivan, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, who is the publisher of the Tribune. This article says that University of Utah political science professor J.D. Williams calls Tribune publisher and Alta Club member Jack Gallivan, also part of the uh, Bohemian Grove, the kingpin in Salt Lake City's power structure. He continues right up there with him is Gordon Hinckley, a counselor in the first presidency of the Mormon church. Principle number three, right? We have to understand the enemy we face. Just kind of re recapping that. We'll or we will not be effective in our efforts to defend liberty and build the kingdom of God. Now I want to get into the tentacles of the conspiracy. We're talking about how the Alta Club is kind of the funnel that the international conspiracy uses to get its influence and its programs into the state of Utah. So we have first, the first tentacle we want to cover is the United Nations. You can't get much more international conspiracy than that. So we have kind of a, a strong distinction. We have the Declaration of Independence that says your rights from, come, come from God, and that government's only job is to protect those rights that God gave you, not to give them to you, can't take them away legitimately, whereas the United Nations says that rights can be limited by government, which means that they're the ones that give you your rights. Their Declaration of Human Rights says that rights can in no way be exercised contrary to the purposes of the United Nations. So these two organizations, these two principles, these two documents, are completely diametrically opposed to each other. United Nations Agenda 29, I mentioned that, rights and freedoms may in no case be exercised contrary to the principles of the United Nations. Let's talk about the, the founders of the UN. We have here a convicted spy, Alger Hiss, who was uh, a spy for the Soviet Union. Soviet agent uh, Molotov was one of the chief architects of the UN Charter. And Soviet sympathizer and Council on Foreign Relations member, Leo Pazvlovsky. So Leo Pazvlovsky, he wrote an article called Moving Toward a Governed World. He wants to move us towards world government. He says the idea of a governed world is not new in the history of mankind, but it was not until the processes of the world war had demonstrated its feasibility that it ceased to be a dream and approached reality. All of the spells, all of this spells the inevitability of a world government. Slowly and torturously, but unmistakably and surely, we are moving toward a governed world. Slowly, torturously, Communist Manifesto, Karl Marx, these small, small steps that seem economically insufficient and untenable. Same policy moving forward to build world government. These things are not happening by accident, right? Just kind of over and over again. The United Nations, they put out this magazine talking about Agenda 21 and their programs for it, their aims for it. It says that effective execution of Agenda 21 will require a profound reorientation of all human society. Unlike anything the world has ever experienced, a major shift in the priorities of both governments and individuals, and an unprecedented redeployment of human and financial resources, this shift will demand that a concern for the environmental consequences of every human action be integrated into individual and collective decision-making at every level, every level. So your city is involved in this, your county's involved in this, your state's involved in this, and of course, Congress and the president is involved in this. You see, George Bush, uh, the Gen 21's first program was 
in the 1991-1992 uh, uh, Earth Summit at Rio de Janeiro. And then in 1993, you have Bill Clinton. So this is bipartisan betrayal, signs executive order, which authorizes the creation of the President's Council on Sustainable Development. And they wrote an article about um, how to implement Agenda 21, now Agenda 2030. Sustainable America said that we must move towards stabilization of the U.S. population and a reduced rate of population growth in the United States and the world. So global control, global government, global population control, telling you how much children you can have, China's one-child policy, controlling how many children that you're allowed to have, and murdering people. We're going to talk about that as well. And then we have here with Agenda 2030, Sustainable Development Goals are the new programs to implement those things. So we're not, we're not dealing with the lesser of two evils. It wasn't George Bush, wasn't the lesser evil compared to, to Bill Clinton. They're both working for the same exact agenda. If we don't understand that, we can't grasp that, we're going to continue voting and supporting candidates and individuals and programs that are implementing these things that, that we've quoted from. Now we have here in 2016, so the program continues to slowly roll out. The Secretary General says remarks for meeting on regionalism and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Regional governments are essential for building this world government system. They said, the drafters of the United Nations Charter recognize the importance of regional action. And the drafters of the 2030 Agenda also look, uh, took that appreciation for the pivotal role of regionalism to a deeper level for the 21st century. World leaders recognize the crucial role of regional cooperation in implementing and assessing progress. Then we have here another United Nations article it says in the post COVID-19 world, the 2030 agenda demands more cooperation and regional integration, more multilateralism and greater productive integration. And another, this is the commission on global governance that produced this document about implementing agenda 2030. And they write, regionalism must precede globalism. So when you have all these different organizations talking about regionalism, they know what they're doing. They're moving towards this regionalism to bring us towards globalism. We foresee a seamless system of governance from local communities, individual states, regional unions, and up through the United Nations itself. From your local communities, all the way up to world government. The development of regionalism cannot be isolated from global institutions. Affecting each other in many ways, these groups should be linked in a dynamic process of interaction. Regional arrangements have the potential to complement and contribute to global governments. These, these small steps bring us into the bigger picture. The UN must prepare for a time when regionalism becomes more ascendant worldwide and even help the process along. It is committed to doing so. The Secretary General has called repeatedly for a strengthening of regionalism in global governance. They make you think that you're, you're, this is all, you know, your local sovereignty, your local governments are involved in this, but this is essential towards global governance. The development of global governance is part of the evolution of human efforts to organize life on the planet. We are convinced that it is time for the world to move on from the designs evolved over the centuries and give new form in the establishment of the United Nations nearly 50 years ago. I'm trying to get them to step up to the plate. And then in 2016, there was the United Nations uh, Conference, an NGO conference uh, for educational education for global citizenship, global citizenship. And they were this uh, a part of Agenda 2030. This is the development goals for Agenda 2030. And uh, they talk about at the conference, they had an article that said a key to achieving Agenda 2030. What's the key to achieving Agenda 2030 with global citizenship? An ethos of global citizenship is required in order to fulfill this bold, people-centered, universal, and planet-sensitive development framework. They have to start pushing the idea of global citizenship as opposed to national or local citizenship. And so um, just back at just a, a few years ago, you had uh, One World Together at Home and promoting the idea of says global citizen with the World Health Organization. 
And then on the local level, we have an individual that speaks about why they're involved in what was going on with the COVID-19 lockdowns and global citizenship. As you know, attendance at this general conference has been strictly limited as part of our efforts to be good global citizens and do all we can to limit the spread of COVID-19. Okay, so we're good global citizens and we're not, we're, we're trying to stop the spread of this fake pandemic. So how it's sold, they have all these different um, agenda items that they're trying to, on different subjects, you're gonna wanna break it down to key things, to key points. They want uh, their goals, they say, are to destroy land availability. They wanna get land off limits to human use. They wanna limit your access to land, restrict the production so that prices will then raise, be raised. They wanna balkanize the economy and they wanna eat up the people's sustenance. So to do that, the first, the state and fed, they eat up land. You have the Bureau of Land Management, you have uh, federal lands, you have national parks, uh, you have state parks, you have uh, just the, the state and local levels and, and national levels are just taking these huge swaths of land and making it off limits, which uh, makes it so land is more expensive and not available. Zoning is another way that they make land you know, less available. The high density housing and commerce is a huge part of it. They're, they talk about how there's a housing crisis. And so even in small cities, in small states like Wyoming, they're building high density housing because there's just not enough you know, available uh, housing for, for people. This other ridiculous comments and saying that high density housing is the only way to do it. Well, what's going on in, in places like Hong Kong, where you have an island with limited land and with the, they're building high density housing, these towers that go straight up and people aren't, they're not only just living in small apartments, they're literally living in dog kennels and they're paying the equivalent of $2,000 a month to live in a dog kennel. What does that do? Besides, you know, it's, it's, it's humiliating, it's demoralizing, makes you a slave, you can't grow your own food, you're dependent upon the government for water, but what else does it do? It limits the family. You're not gonna have kids if you're living inside of a dog kennel. Industry regulations restrict physical transportation. And so they have different programs like uh, cars for clunkers. Um, they uh, do things uh, like where they're charging um, in like the state of Washington and even in Utah, they're, they're talking about doing this where it's the conservative solution to fight climate change is to charge you for every mile you drive for your car registration. And so they're tracking where you're going, how much you're driving, and then charging you for traveling. For traveling. So, and then they uh, subsidize public transportation, which could not function on its own. It could not survive on its own. There's none of the passengers. And so they do things like free ride days or their uh, different legislation to actually make the trains uh, completely free all the time. And so that way people are, it's too expensive to drive, and then they have this free transportation to get where they're going. You have 15 minute cities dragging, pushing people into these big units. And with the zoning, we see that happening where if you live out in the country, you're not allowed to build more than one house for every 20, 30, 50 acres. Whereas when you live in the city, states like Utah and other states or like Washington and Oregon and California have done this, where in certain cities, well, now in the entire state of Washington, you're not allowed to build single family um, houses at all, period. So it's the exact opposite. You have to build high density housing when you're in the cities. They wanna make sure that you are dependent upon them for everything that you have. And then of course, building regional governments and then cap and trade as we move on with that. Been around for a while. So we have government theft of land. We have 630 million acres. 20% of the, nation, the nation's total uh, land mass is owned by the federal government, which is a communist program. And of course, the Western states are the ones that have most of their land. The most liberty-oriented people have had their land stolen from them by state and federal governments. State of Utah, you can see here, um, just for an example, you have all the gray area is BLM land. Department of Defense is the, uh, the Navy color. And then you have uh, the Fish and Wildlife and you have a National Park Service and on and on and on of different organizations that uh, control and have stolen the land and leaving it so that there's only a certain small, just minuscule amount left available for the people to be able to build on and to build families and to grow families. 
And so the federal government, uh, this is a congressional research uh, report from 2020 about federal land ownership moving forward on this. Although 15 states contain less than half a million acres of federal land, the 11 Western states and Alaska each have more than 10 million acres managed by these five agencies within their borders. This contrast is a result of early treaties, land settlement laws and patterns and laws requiring that states agree to surrender any claim to federal lands within their border as a prerequisite for admission into the union. That's, that's a long-term plan. Management of those lands is often controversial, especially in states where the federal government is a predominant or majority landholder and where competing and conflicting uses of the lands are at issue. The federal government, Article 1, Section 8, what are they allowed to own? The Constitution says that they only have authority over all places purchased by the consent of the legislature of the state in which the same shall be for the erection, right? So it can't be just like, oh, we gave them permission. It has to be for a specific purpose, for the erection of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings. Not just making millions of acres completely unavailable for human use, completely and utterly unconstitutional and by design. Now, the next tentacle from the Council on Foreign Relations is, I mean, I'm sorry, the next tentacle of the conspiracy being the Council on Foreign Relations. We have the Council on Foreign Relations. Their goal is to maintain and gradually increase the authority of the United Nations, as they reported to US, the, the Congress in 1959. And it was formed by Colonel Edward Mandel House, who was considered to be President Wilson's right hand, you know, his, his brain. And uh, he said that he wanted to build socialism as dreamed of by Karl Marx. So this founder of the CFR wants to build world government and communism and socialism as dreamed of by Karl Marx. And in Town and Country Magazine, I mentioned that uh, publication again, really gives us a lot of good uh, conspirator insights says that the, the CFR, the Council on Foreign Relations, has long sought to influence U.S. foreign policy. And we have a, another member of the CFR, Professor Mortimer Alder, said that we must do everything we can to, us, to abolish the United States program of the Council on Foreign Relations to build world government. In 1984, Foreign Affairs, the Council on Foreign Relations magazine, we have the former U.N. Secretary General and uh, Kurt Waldenheim, right? As long as states insist that they are supreme arbiters of their destinies, that as sovereign entities, their decisions are subject to no higher authority, international organizations will never be able to guarantee the maintenance of peace. So this thing, as long as we have this idea of national independence, we're just going to keep having wars. We've got to get rid of sovereignty to bring about world peace. And this is an important thing to also point out as he talks about states. Now today, and this is on purpose, we think of states as subdivisions of a larger government entity. And that is by design to make us think that states like Utah or Colorado, Washington, New York, whatever it is, are subservient to the federal government, as opposed to the fact that the founding fathers set up, these were independent nation states. Think of the state of Israel as an independent nation state. The 13 colonies were independent nations that came together to delegate their servant few and defined delegated jobs. So we they are trying to get us not to understand that principle, but here they kind of let that cat out of the bag because they're trying to make it so that the United States as, as an entity is giving up its sovereignty as much as the states have given up its sovereignty to the United States. Council on Foreign Relations uh, formed a subgroup in the from they have their national organization New York, and then across the nation they set up uh, chapters of the American Committees on Foreign Relations, and this is on their website. It says our history that in 1938 the Council on Foreign Relations um, believed it was time to create a number of nonpartisan, nonprofit committees across the country for the purpose of bringing business and professional local leaders together to discuss world events due to isolationist attitudes and emerging international conflicts. And so because there were too many people like in states, you know, especially in the West, 
that believed in national independence, believed in the Constitution. They had to set up specific organizations in these states to get them to give up their ideas of national independence, right? The isolationist, and you translate that, they just mean national independence, sovereignty. And so we see here on this map of their organizations, their, their clubs all across the country, where they, they did focus in those more conservative states, um, like Alabama, like Florida, like o Ohio and Kansas and Oklahoma and Texas, Idaho, Wyoming, Salt Lake City. The Council on Formulations, the Salt Lake chapter, has a website you can go to and check it out yourself and find out what their events are. They have uh, regular events all the time. Once a month, they, they meet together in Salt Lake City. The Council on Foreign Relations does. Now, where do you think the Council on Foreign Relations would meet in the state of Utah? You're right, at the Alta Club. That's the funnel the international conspiracy uses to implement its agenda on the local level. We have here one of their organizations um, one of their, uh, on their website, they have organizations that they approve of, that they say that are a part of uh, promoting the, the agenda that they're promoting. And one of them is the Kennedy Center um, the political department at BYU. And so just uh, go ahead and we'll go through this, this website and kind of show you what, it, what they're saying. As we scroll down, their public foreign relations conference scholarship. And so they fund the Council on Foreign Relations funds. Students at BYU to go to the Council on Foreign Relations and learn how to be internationalists. The Young Leaders Initiative Program was established by the American Committees on Foreign Relations to provide interested and talented students with an exceptional learning experience, right? Uh, the program, uh, the next above paragraph entails meetings with diplomatic personnel, discussion of political issues, participation in uh, sim simulations, dealing with foreign ambassadors, all these different things to get them to get uh, to be just brainwashed into the programs of the Council on Foreign Relations to build world government. So we see here, so who owns, who runs the Council on Foreign Relations in Utah? This is all public record. We have here on uh, the state of Utah has their thing where you can look up uh, businesses at sec uh, secure.utah.gov. And you can see who owns and who controls the, the Council on Foreign Relations uh, here in Utah. It mentions this guy right here as the uh, Dean Collinwood is the registered agent for the Council on Foreign Relations in, in Utah. And who is Dean Collinwood? He teaches at Weber State University. And a part of it, he, he's written books on globalism and he gets his students to, um, gives them extra credit to attend Council on Foreign Relations meetings. Um, other individuals involved in the Salt Lake uh, Committee on Foreign Relations um, we have here is David Deasley, who again, his address is uh, on the government's website. It's all public knowledge and public information. And I'm not doing any, I think that's not available on the government's own website. So I went to go check out his home, just kind of seeing out the neighborhood, what's going on with, you know, what, what kind of place does the, uh, the head of the council and foreign relations live? But on the way there, I saw something that I was not expecting to see. And that's a home right by the, um, the Shriners Hospital. Right there, I was driving by, and if you don't know, you have that symbol right there is is known as the uh, as a pedophile symbol. Um, they've got these just weird. This is maybe not anything specific, but we see here just these weird statues all over their property. This is what I thought was really um, disturbing, and we're going to get into a second even more. Just kind of looking at it, this is this giant. It's taller than me. This giant artwork, artwork is with phallic symbols, with body parts, and they have these naked children statues all across their property that really reminded me of John Podesta and Pizzagate and, and his child sex trafficking um, artwork. And so, but who owns this house that would have this kind of uh, stuff on there, right? And this is a really rich neighborhood. We have John and Marcia Price. These guys are connected on the international level, right? And into Utah. Uh, they have uh, large connections at the University of Utah. They uh, ambassadors to several different countries. Um, they were also parts of major businesses and um, part of the Bush Cheney team in 2000. Uh, also, members of the National Council on Foreign Relations, right here in the state of Utah. 
So other prominent members in Utahns that have been members of the Council on Foreign Relations, we have former uh, Governor John Huntsman, who his name is on um, the, uh, what's it called, the, uh, but not Podestas, we have the uh, Epstein, Epstein's Black Book of people that went to Pedophile Island. And then we have Garrett W. Gong, also a former member of the Council on Foreign Relations, speaking there at the Globalist uh, G20 uh, Forum. So let's look at John Huntsman and the New World Order. In 1993, he joined the Council on Foreign Relations. In 1999, he led Envision Utah, which is an organization in the state working to implement Agenda 21. And in 2007, he came out um, in support of what I mentioned earlier of cap and trade, which is a part of Agenda 2030. Um, he backed, again, Obamacare and forced health care mandates in 2007. He backed the trillion dollar bank bailouts. He also supports uh, forcing the state to recognize sodomite marriages. And he attended the Bilderberg Conference in 2012. And he joined in 2015 the Atlantic Council, which is a branch of the Council on Foreign Relations. And he endorsed Mike Lee for U.S. Senate. And like I said, he was discovered in Jeffrey Epstein, Epstein's little black book. Now let's look at uh, Garagong. In the annual report from 1987, 1988, we see the Council on Formulations, Garrett Gong. And um, he, he wrote some books uh, leading up till his, you know, back in the, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and all the way up till 2010, um, talking about these are all scrubbed from the internet. So they're very difficult to find. Um, but as one of the benefits of membership, I was able, I've been able to scour them down, spend a lot of money uh, getting them and scanning them and finding different places that have them and putting them in our membership portal. So that's one of the benefits of membership in the Tree of Liberty Society. Uh, you get to, to read through these documents yourself. Uh, one of those documents was China and the Soviet Union, where he's talking about the praising China, uh, China's revolution, another article praising communist China, Taiwan's straight dilemmas, empires and civilizations, remembering and forgetting, memory and history, Russia's Bermuda Triangle, the beginning of history and the standard of civilization. Standard of civilization has, all of these have just uh, quotes that just talk about world government and praising Mao and praising China. But I wanna bring out some, some key quotes out of um, his International Studies Review in 2010. So very shortly um, before he became more well known uh, to those in mainstream society, he says, quote, that certain forces are at work in world politics striving to impose a purposefully chartered, charted uh, directionality on our world's near-term history and, and future. So there's forces at work. So kind of like this mysterious dark, well, maybe he's promoting, he's saying it's a good thing, are working to, you know, build and direct the world's, um, to direct society in the, in the world um, in the near term and the future. And in his book, The Standard of Civilization, he says, uh, that we're now being made to enshrine demands for a new international economic order, a new international information order, so economics, information, and a new international cultural order within whatever legality United Nations resolutions proffer. It's hard to see the, the context of this. There's just too much context to be able to put into a slide. Uh, but again, we have that book available for any of our members to read. And uh, you can get the full context that he's supporting this. He's not saying this is a bad thing. He's saying that we, these forces are important and we need to have the UN structure to implement this new economic, education, and cultural order. And in, um, in 2001, he wrote, these remembering and forgetting issues will shape the future, a future in which the way the peoples and countries remember and forget will structure the international system. And so with this new international information order, 1984 Orwell's in you know memory hole. We're going to make sure that things are forgotten, and then certain things are brought up to our memory to direct us in the direction that this international conspiracy wants us to move into. And so, in 2001, he also uh, wrote that the belief in general principles of law, as recognized by civilized nations, made its way from a convocation of civilized states gathered in 1899 to the not dissimilar group, which convened in London, 24th of October, 1945, to ratify the Charter of the United Nations. At the first session of the General Assembly, the International Court of Justice held its inaugural setting in April of 1946 at the Peace Palace, to which Baron de Descamps had referred to in his appeal to civilized conscience 
and began his judicial business proper on 22nd of May, 1947, when the Core Food Channel case opened. So he says this is, you know, the general principles recognized by civilized nations. So the implement, the, in, the what, what he's implying here, the implication here is that if you're not going along with this international court, you're not going along with world government, then you're not civilized. And then he talks about Mao here in um, the China's fourth revolution. He says in 1944, 49, Mao Zedong's revolution transformed China into the People's Republic. And then he just talked about how, um, you know, and, and he praised, transformed it into the republic uh, that it was. And then he praised um, Mao over the um, more liberty-minded Chiang Kai-shek and uh, encouraged uh, the, uh, in different policy papers, the strengthening and supporting of China. And then he also spoke at the G20 Interfaith Forum. Their mission is to they advance global solutions by collaborating with religious thought leaders and political representatives. The Interfaith Forum offers an annual platform where a network of religiously linked institutions and, in, and initiatives engage on global agendas, primarily in including the Sustainable Goals or SDGs, so Agenda 2030. The G20 Interfaith Forum organizes its work through a series of working groups which focus on areas of recurring relevance to G20 policy priorities, one of them being gender equality. And so that, you know, to some, you know, population at large, that might not seem like, what's wrong with that? That's exactly what led to mothers leaving the home and is now leading to the, trans, the, uh, the, the, the transgender and sodomite supremacy movement. So now the next tentacle of the conspiracy, because we see the Council on Relations and it's strong link to the, the United Nations, another internationalist organization, uh, part of the tentacle of the beast. And it's important for us to understand that these are tentacles of this hydra beast, because if we think of it as, oh, I discovered the, the, the skull and bones, and we just we, we destroy that, and we've got the conspiracy, it's all done. No, you, just like in, in Greek mythology of this hydra monster, you cut off one tentacle, not realizing that it's part of a bigger monster, to move into its place. You don't know about the other organizations that are part of this. And so we have to understand the tentacles and realizing its connection. Uh, and that it's part of a grander connected conspiracy, that these aren't separate conspiracies. So now best sources to learn about in detail, we just don't have time for tonight, to learn about the Skull and Bones. We have the, lost, the, the last secrets of Skull and Bones. We have America's secret establishment and an introduction to the order of Skull and Bones as well. And so just some interesting facts about uh, the events leading to Anthony Sutton's death, which is printed in the most recent edition of America's Secret Establishment. It says that uh, the original publisher of the book ceased publication. And so Trine Day Publishing is formed with the purpose of just printing this book. And at the same time, two strangers move upstairs in an apartment uh, that Sutton lived in. And then Sutton all of a sudden dies of natural causes. Two weeks after publishing of the new edition begins, and then immediately thereafter, those two strangers move out. Pretty interesting. So the founders, let's talk about the founders of Skull and Bones at, uh, in, in, in the United States. We have William Huntington Russell and Alfonso Taft. The organization, Russell joined a secret society in Germany throughout, um, thought to be the Totenbund, the Totenbund, which is called, which in English, Gateway of the Dead, Brotherhood of Death, which was a branch of the Illuminati. Uh, Russell and Taft formed the Skull and Bones with faculty support at Yale in 1833. Pretty interesting how things happen. Satan has his counterfeits popping up around the same time God puts up his program. The organization is oriented to the postgraduate outside world. So it's not just about making sure that the school and that they're, they're really good uh, um, students and that they're just showing their school spirit. No, the whole purpose of it is focusing on what are they going to be doing in the future outside of college? It's the recruitment ground of the college age into the international order. Order members meet annually at Deer Island on the St. Lawrence River. So the initiation we have here that uh, this is recordings that uh, and documents and letters that were leaked to Anthony Sutton that he published in his book. 
Um, so we know this is a description of some insiders that were describing this, saying, quote, new man is placed in coffin, carried into central part of building. New man chanted over and reborn into society. So like a satanic counterfeit of baptism and reborn. Removed from coffin and given robes with symbols on it. A bone with his name on it is tossed into bone heap at the start of every meeting. Initiates plunged naked into mud pile. Uh, the theme of death and rebirth. This is that satanic, satanic counterfeit to what God does. They lay naked in a coffin. And they, in the coffin, while they're laying naked with another man, the previous initiate into the Skull and Bones Society, they confess their sexual history. Patriarchs, meaning the previous uh, bonesmen that are initiating the new people, they're dressed as skeletons and acting as wild-eyed lunatics. They howl and screech at the new initiates. The initiates are required to wrestle naked in the mud piles I mentioned, and the initiation is considered a harrowing ordeal by those involved. Um, upon initiation, the member is given a new name. They're called knight such and such. A new name, satanic counterfeit to God's plan. Former year knights become patriarch such and such. So they go from knight, and then the next year they go to patriarch. There, the order clothes the newborn knight in his own special garments, symbolizing that henceforth he will tailor himself to the order's mission. Again, satanic counterfeit. They swear an oath of secrecy as to what goes on in the organization. And they are given large sums, uh, uh, large uh, lump sums of money, a grandfather clock, and loans if they need them, to make sure that they're never, you know, put in a position where they're down in their luck, and they want to sell their secrets to make some money. Make sure just keep them um, in, in a position where they are never in need of money to sell these secrets. The initiation process is essentially a variation of brainwashing or encounter group processes. The ritual is designed to mold establishment zombies to ensure continuation of power in the hands of a small select group from one generation to another. And so the things that they're working to, to build, they want to change society to accept and adopt the new world order. Heavily restrict individual freedom, and their focus is on transforming society to accept these things, politics, economics, and culture, education, which I get into, of course, in Invasion Volume 1 and 2. And so we can see that they, these different tentacles, they're not a part of a different conspiracy. You see a lot of overlap where they're a part of, people are a part of the same organ, uh, lots of the same people are involved in these different organizations because it needs to have this semblance of everybody's working on this. And then if you chop off one of the tentacles, they can still move forward if you don't understand the big picture. And so you can see here some pictures of different classes of Skull and Bones members standing in front of um, the, the skulls and bones. So this is kind of an interesting thing that was brought out in Sutton's book. He says, the opposite of the mask is the skull. The face of the person is a fleshy skin worn between the two. People who deny the person as made in the image of God directly and individually created and loved by him will seek either of these exits to being uh, truly human. These exits, meaning the skull or a mask. The mask, which covers the mortal man, or the skull, which is left after mortal man has departed. Primitive, primitive minds who have not yet found God and sophisticates who have rejected him desire the mask and the skull. Now, you know, this symbology is, is, is pretty, you know, um, revealing. But then we take into account the events of the last, you know, three or four years, and we start to see the significance of why the international conspiracy worked so hard to get everybody to participate in their rituals. And the order has long standing and significant links to the relatively small Unitarian Church. And uh, former President William Taft, whose father co founded the order, was president of the Unitarian Association. Uh, Cumby, who was um, the author of The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow, identifies the link between Hitler and the New Age movement and former research by this author linked the order to the founding and growth of Nazism. Most significantly, Cumby states that the New Age movement plans to bring about the New World Order, which will be a synthesis between the USSR, Great Britain, and the United States. So the New Age movement is kind of the religious part of the New World Order uh, being promoted amongst those that are awakened and enlightened into accepting these things, thinking that they are rejecting them. 
Finally, Cumby points out that the Antichrist and satanic aspects are woven into the cult of the New Age movement. So now we see the similarities shared between Skull and Bones and the Illuminati. They both originate in Germany. The Illuminati founded the University of Ingolstadt, recruiting heavily among students, just like Skull and Bones. Skull and Bones is the chapter of a German secret society founded at Yale, where it recruits its members. They both utilize secrecy. Both organizations swear their members to secrecy. Both must refuse to discuss even their membership. As we showed uh, last uh, in the last class, we had both George W. Bush and John Kerry, when they were asked about it in public, had to change the subject quickly. Uh, quote, the great strength of our order lies in its concealment. Let it never appear in any place in its own name, but always covered by another name and another occupation. Letter between two members of the Illuminati. And so that's why it's so important not to focus on names, organizations, and focus on the principles of what they're building, because they themselves admit that they use secrecy. They change their names and the names of their organizations so that they're not found out that they're working towards this. They both use their power and influence to benefit fellow members. Quote, the power of the order must surely be turned to the advantage of its members. All must be assisted. They must be preferred to all persons otherwise of equal merit. So concealment and cover-up, right? They say, this is again Adam Weishaupt saying, quote, this is the founder of the Illuminati, a cover is always necessary. In concealment lies the great part of our strength. Hence, we must always hide ourselves under the name of another society. So at um, Yale, we talked about scroll and key. They have wolf's head. And then at the University of Utah, they have skull and bones and owl and key, secret society organizations. We look at George W. Bush and his own autobiography. This is his writings on it. He says, my senior year, I joined skull and bones, a secret society. So secret, I can't say anything more. It was a chance to make 14 new friends, all you'll say. And then Russell Marion Nelson in his autobiography, From Heart to Heart wrote, university life was wonderful and successful. On April 3rd, 1944, I was elected president of Sigma Chi fraternity. I was also later elected to the honorary societies of Skull and Bones in the junior year, Owl and Key in the senior year. So we're gonna talk more about Owl and Key and Skull and Bones of the University of Utah. So Skull and Bones, was formed um, at, so Yale in 1833, at the University of Utah in 1910. And it was formed by a Yale alumni. So a member of the Yale organization, Skull and Bones, came to Utah in 1910 and formed the chapter here at the University of Utah. And this is just a, a page out of the uh, uh, University of Utah's uh, yearbook from 1925. And um, they had an article in the yearbook where they talk about the organization. They say the society is a secret one, just like, because it's the same organization. It's another chapter, of the same organization at Yale. We have to understand that these aren't separate organizations with separate, you know, goals. The society is a secret one and their ways are deep and mysterious. Here we have um, another the university yearbook talking about skull and bones, saying skull and bones makes us believe in infanticide. Infanticide, the murder, the killing of babies. The skull and bones makes us believe in that. Now here's an article about um, the, the disturbing and mentally anguishing nature of skull and bones initiation. We have here that uh, Tom Morrow, while being initiated into skull and bones, uh, goes temporarily insane. He went mad because of the initiation into skull and bones at the University of Utah. So we, we have the same style of initiations at both organizations. And uh, further on in the article, it says that there was great excitement. Tom Morrow, a prominent student, crazed uh, through too zealous study of the skeleton in, is seen raving about the vicinity of the university. Prexy uh, frantically telephones the police, meaning that the, so the head of the university telephones the police, explaining that the university will pay all expenses to Provo. So this initiate just goes crazy and, be, and just tears the Provo up, basically. And the University of, Utah, uh, University of Utah president calls up the police and says, you know, I'm sorry this happened. We'll, we'll take care of everything. Don't worry about it. So a sample of high profile members. We have Senator Robert F. Bennett, who is um, a longtime senator for the state of Utah, and Robert D. Hales, 
We have here the Skull and Bones Yearbook, University of Utah, and an article from the Skull paper says that Robert Hales wasn't just a member of Skull and Bones, but he was the head of the organization. And then Owl and Key, we're gonna learn more about Owl and Key. Members of Skull and Bones, the Junior Men's Honorary Society, automatically become Owl and Key members. So becoming a member of Owl and Key is a step up. You're, you're advancing from one organization to the next. Uh, the university newspaper reported that members of Skull and Bones automatically become Owl and Key members. We have another report that talks about, it says here, the sober members of the Royal Order of Owl and Key the men who last year had undergone the humiliations, sorrows, thrills, joys, and, and stimulating effects of qualifying for skull and bones, utilized their greatest and rarest ingenuity in smearing ungodly costumes and requirements on the year's goats. I get into what goat means in the volume two of my book, Invasion, but they are involved in this ungodly behavior. And in 2015, 2018, the University of Utah's paper met with members of Skull and Bones. This is, their, this is what they wore, the same outfits that they wear at the initiation that has been caught on tape at Yale. So they have unified statements on the jab. Members of Skull and Bones continue to promote the jab. You have uh, Nelson on his own uh, Twitter account says, Wendy and I are vaccinated today against COVID-19. We are thankful for the countless individuals who performed the work required to make this possible. We have prayed for this literal godsend. Receiving the vaccine is part of our personal efforts to be global, good global citizens. John Kerry, another uh, Skull and Bones member, I mean, beyond grateful to the scientists around the globe who developed COVID-19 vaccines and for the brave medical providers everywhere, and especially to those at the Department of Veteran Affairs, who have risked their own lives the last year to help others. George Bush says, his wife and I um, are grateful to have been vaccinated. These safe and effective vaccines are our way out of this pandemic and toward recover and renewal. So when it's your turn, roll up your sleeves and do your part. Now we go to the next uh, tentacle in this beast. We have the Bohemian Club, which was established in Sa San Francisco, California in 1872. And I want to quickly show you a uh, just some of this uh, sneaked footage of their ritual of worshiping the owl god. So shall we burn thee once again this night? Flames the deep thine empty. We shall read the sign. Midsummer sets across flame. We shall burn thee once again. <laughs> Flame, which hither ye have fought from regions where I reign. Ye fools and priests, I spit upon your fire. Listen to all mortal wisdom. Our Bohemia, we beseech thee, grant us thy counsel. Hey, they, they put on this cremation of care. It's this mock human sacrifice. They cremate care, the cares of the world, to the owl of Bohemia. And they are praying to the owl of Bohemia to grant them their wisdom. And in this ritual, so who, who are the people that attend this, this ritual? You have people in prominent positions of power in, in government, in uh, business, and in academia, as usual. Bush is here. Newt Ginrich, and others. And in 1886, a Salt Lake chapter of the Bohemian Club was formed. It says that the Bohemian Club was organized at, in Salt Lake City, and the Alta acknowledged an invitation to become a charter member. Among some of the members are Harry Edwards, and just kind of lists off some of the names of the individuals. It was also the home of the underground for sodomite activists uh, up until the 1940s. And uh, we talked about this guy earlier, is the kingpin. Jack Gallivan was a member of the Alta Club, publisher of the Salt Lake Tribune, and member of the San Francisco Bohemian Club. So now the next tentacle of the conspiracy I want to talk about is the Buckshot Caucus. So we ask ourselves, right, what's more dangerous? 
we have these wolves. That's pretty dangerous. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to mess with that. These guys are, are pretty vicious. But then compare that to the wolf in sheep's clothing. Now, I would say that the wolf in sheep's clothing is much, much more dangerous because those ravaging wolves, you are going to avoid like the plague. But that wolf that, that pretends to be peaceful and pretends to be one of you and dresses like you and talks like you to get you to go along with that agenda is far more dangerous than the open wolf. And so that's why, you know, so much we, we don't focus on, oh, those pesky Democrats. You know, it's those are kind of the open wolves. It's the wolves in sheep's clothing, the ones that are pretending to talk about the Constitution, the ones pretending to talk about liberty. Those are the dangerous ones. And Carol Quigley, um, who wrote Tragedy and Hope, which was one of these books that admitted he studied their papers of the conspiracy and talked about how they implemented the conspiracy. And that the only thing he disagreed with was that they wanted to remain a secret. He says that the two parties, Republican and Democrat, should be almost identical so that the American people can throw the rascals out at any election without leading to any profound or extensive shifts in policy. That's why they want you fighting over, we got to get so-and-so elected, otherwise the other guy's going to get elected. Because they know that there's no difference, that both people are working for the same agenda. And so we get caught up in, oh, well, maybe it's slower, maybe we're going to, no, they are working for the same. And in fact, the wolf in sheep's clothing is going to get you to go along with it much more effectively than the open wolf. So we have to diagnose the enemy. We're talking about the Buckshot Caucus. Utah policy at uh, really was kind of like the insider's newspaper for where the conspiracy goes to read about what's going on. They had an article called Bacon's Guns and the Bacon Guns and the Buckshot Caucus. Who really runs GOP politics in Utah? In the article, it says Utah policy is told that members of the GOP Illuminati Buckshot Caucus are at it again in the Utah legislature. The 170 member group is made up of establishment Republican insiders, both office holders, lobbyists, among others. So it's not just people in power, like I mentioned earlier with the CFR, it's the people behind the scenes that are the, the puppet masters of the people that you see in the news. So they link to Illuminati on Wikipedia. They're not shy about what they're referring to. They're talking about the Bavarian Illuminati. They have their own logo in the Pell pen, which is using the Illuminati all-seeing eye. And Illuminati, I mean, the Buckshot, Utah Illuminati members, used to, before we did our first exposure on it, used to use that hashtag on social media, identifying each other, Utah Illuminati. So now we have Carl Downing, who's one of the founders of this organization, and he works for the Department of Workforce Services, and he a Republican working to get Republicans elected in the state of Utah, like Governor Herbert. And on his own Facebook profile, again, before we started to expose this, he's changed this since then. He says, who knows how this blank, blank, black hand moves inside the halls of power? That article in Utah policy ends with, who knows how this buckshot black hand moves inside the halls of power? Took out buckshot, Illuminati, black hand. What is the black hand? These conspirators, to, they'll, they'll try to like poo-poo it, laugh it off sometimes. But for themselves, they have two signs so that you know, so that the, they know, the insiders know who they really are. They're talking amongst themselves. The Black Hand was a secret society that was actually behind uh, the assassinations that led to World War I. And they are the direct subsidiary of the Bavarian Illuminati with its constitution based on the Illuminati's. So they call themselves the Illuminati. They refer to themselves as the Black Hand. They're telling you who they are. It's not a joke. Carl Downing, the founder, one of the co-founders of the Buckshot Caucus, says that statewide, Utah is just barely over 50% Mormon and shrinking. I'm sorry. Um, and it, Salt Lake City is very Democrat and one of the gayest cities in the U.S. and proud of it. Response was, yeah, I've heard Salt Lake City isn't as Mormon as the rest of Utah. I was shocked when I heard that. Yeah, just, they just elected Jackie Buskipski as mayor, and she's openly gay. This Republican says it's pretty great. It's a pretty great state, and it's getting better. It's getting better because we're becoming less religious, becoming less conservative constitutionalist, and becoming more and more engaged in the sodomite supremacy agenda. 
sometimes, you know, they, they'd like to poo poo it, but sometimes they actually say who they really are. Former party chairman of the Republican party in Cache County says, check out the history of the original Illuminati. They were on the right side of most issues at the time. Freedom fighters. That's what they say. Now there was, they, they involved in rituals. This is a satanic conspiracy. And just like we have the skull and bones or satanic rituals, the uh, Buckshot Caucus has their own strange rituals. At a special election where a legislator had um, resigned in the middle of the session, they had a special election where all of the uh, delegates got together to vote on a new replacement. And there were three candidates. And uh, they said, before we uh, vote on this, we, we need to do a, a, a ceremony. We need to do a few things where we need to have this bowl and we're gonna of green M&Ms and we're gonna spray paint them green. We have these... Uh, Flowers, roses made out of paper, and these guns wrapped in bacon, uh, Dr. Pepper can on its, you know, on a, on a, at an angle. And so they all elected, it all worked to elect Cheryl Acton in District 38. What's interesting about this is that there was a, it got narrowed down to two candidates, and um, they held the election. Two candidates, odd number of individuals voting. Can't have a tie, but it ended up in a tie. And so they flipped the coin and got their buckshot member elected. So now we look at the kind of like an overview map structure of how the international conspiracy starts to funnel its way through the Alta Club and throughout the state of Utah to implement the internationalist agenda. You have the Alta Club, whose leaders have been part of a Vatican secret society called the Sovereign Order of St. John of Jerusalem. You have the Council on Relations that meets there every single month. Every single governor from 1880, um, 1883 until today has been a member of the Alta Club. Uh, many of our U.S. senators are members of the Alta Club as well as speak there. Salt Lake Tribune is a part of it. Salt Lake Chamber, of course. State, many of our state legislators are a part of it. Envision Utah works uh, through it. The World Trade Center, University of Utah, Skull and Bones, Zions Bank, and of course, the Utah Illuminati. Hopefully this has shown us this, this principle that our freedoms are not being eroded on accident. It's not, whoops, that we have people working in secret to do evil on purpose. That we're not dealing with just the lesser of two evils. That we have people that are pretending to be your friend when they are really your enemy laughing behind your back as they lead you down to destruction. And that if we don't understand this, we will continue to spin our wheels and be ineffective in our efforts to preserve lost liberty. So next time, as a part of that, that wolves and sheep's clothing, it's key to understand false opposition. And so our next class is going to be on that very same topic, followed by solutions. What do we do about this? I don't want to be the most informed person in the concentration camp. I hope you don't want to just be an information junkie looking for the latest and greatest news, but you want this information so that then you can be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. So I encourage you to join with us and become a part of the solution, become a part of the community, working to build understanding and to restore lost liberty. Now, uh, if, if you're watching this on, uh, online uh, through our uh, boot camp on our website, um, recorded, please go through the questionnaire and see what you're able to retain and see if you need to go through the class again and, uh, and then go on to our next class being on false opposition. Until then, I'll see you next time.